Acts chapter 23. making our way through the book of Acts, and we're just about to the end, aren't we? (laughs) Those of you who have been with us uh, since last summer, I don't know if you thought that it would take this long to get through Acts or not. (laughs) Um, That's the joy of expository preaching, but uh, also it's the challenge as well to keep folks interested and interested. engaged with the scriptures uh, as you make it, you know, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, particularly in some of these longer ones. Um, I think this is probably the longest one I've ever done in, in my ministry. Uh, and we haven't even, you know, done some of the longer ones like Luke or Matthew or anything like that. So um, this, is, this has been quite fun as we've been able to see it unpack and unfold in front of us. Uh, But last week, and we're in chapter 23, verse 12 today, Uh, last week as we looked at 22 through the first part of 23, uh, we saw where Paul went before the Sanhedrin after he had been arrested there in Jerusalem, and how he was encouraged by Jesus with all of that he's experiencing, all of what he's gone through. Uh, Jesus stood there in the jail cell with him and told him to have courage, that I'm not done with you yet, you still got to get to Rome, and uh, nothing's going to keep you from getting there, nothing's going to keep my plan from unfolding. And so what we actually see here uh, in this particular chapter is some of how that unfolds. Uh, These two chapters, what we see uh, in 23 and then later in 24, uh, teach a lot on the kingdom of God, and, and in, good instruction for those of us that are seeking the kingdom of God. And one of the most obvious truths out of these chapters, and even tying in with last week, uh, is this one truth. God is in control. God is in control. And because of that, you and I as believers can keep calm, knowing that he is sovereign and that he's going to work out his plans and that he's going to make sure that it comes to completion, even if we find ourselves in stressful situations. You ever been in a stressful situation? <laughs> Stress is like, you know, just part of life sometimes, isn't it? But God is in control. He's in control in the midst of the storms. He's in control in the valley. He's in control when you're on the mountaintop and when things are going well. That's the beauty of our creator God. Nothing escapes his attention. Nothing's outside his purpose or his plan. He sees all. He knows all. And as we said last week, you know, eight, Romans 8.28 can kind of be our walking theme, if you will, through these last couple of chapters. God works out all things to the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. We see that here today. Paul finds himself in some pretty stressful situations uh, over these next couple of chapters. Uh, I don't know about you, if you like watching suspense shows or dramas on TV or seeing a suspenseful movie, that sort of thing. But in life, as much as we might enjoy it, you know, for entertainment, in life we kind of like things calm, don't we? (laughs) Let other people have the drama. Let other people have the problems. Let us just kind of have a a smooth sailing uh, through life, if you will. But again, that's not the life that we have. In In this passage, Paul actually is the object of a terrorist attack. Then he's a defendant in a very tense course case that looks unwinnable. And John Stott, he's a Christian author, says Paul's chances of surviving the attacks of these angry Jews and mighty Romans resemble that of a butterfly before a steamroller. That's a good word picture there for you. (laughs) But yet, but Paul here is able to remain calm. He's able to remain courageous, and he's able to submit, submit himself to the sovereign plan of God. So let's dive in. 
Acts 23, starting with verse 12. When it was morning, the Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves under a curse not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 who had formed this plot. These men went to the chief priests and elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a solemn curse that we won't eat anything until we have killed Paul. So now you, along with the Sanhedrin, make a request to the commander that he bring him down to you as if you were going to investigate his case more thoroughly. But before he gets near, we are ready to kill him. But the son of Paul's sister, hearing about their ambush, came and entered the barracks and reported it to Paul. Paul called one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the commander because he has something to report to him. So he took him, brought him to the commander and said, The prisoner Paul called me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took him by the hand, led him aside, and inquired privately, What is it that you have to report to me? The Jews, he said, have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the Sanhedrin tomorrow, as though they are going to hold a somewhat more careful in inquiry about him. Don't let them persuade you, because there are more than 40 of them lying in ambush, men who have been bound themselves under a curse not to eat or drink until they have killed him. Now they are ready waiting for your consent. So the commander dismissed the young man and instructed him, don't tell anyone that you have informed me about this. Now, we're going to stop right here and think about this for a moment. Anywhere in this section do you see the word God appear? Or Jesus? Or anything about the Holy Spirit? In fact, as we'll continue to read, you don't see any of that described at all in this passage. Kind of reminds me of the book of Esther, where you don't see that mentioned anywhere as well. God's name is missing in Esther, just as it is as here, but yet his fingerprints are everywhere within this story. What we see here with the nephew, what we're going to see next coming up, his fingerprints are everywhere. And so what I want us to do as we work through this today and as we think about God being in control is to be reminded that sometimes we don't see when God is at work. In fact, a lot of times we don't see when God is at work. We might even wonder, God, where are you in this? You know, this, this doesn't feel good. I don't like this. Why aren't you doing something about it? And then maybe if the Lord is favorable, years later, months might pass, maybe be you know, after the episode, or you might not ever know. But if the Lord's favorable, you might have an opportunity to look back and say, that's where he was at. Kind of like the footprints poem, right? That's where God was at work. That's where Jesus showed up and rescued me. That's where the Holy Spirit came and comforted me. Or it could be like Job and never get the answer. And so in those times, in those moments, my encouragement to us this morning is to remember that God is always in control. We might not see him at work, but he's always in control. God works in a various ways to accomplish his purposes, even when we can't see him. In this passage, the same Jesus who promised that Paul would get to Rome works through people and situations to make that happen. Here, God uses an unnamed nephew to thwart a plot. And this is the very next day, Luke tells us, where G Jesus has reassured Paul in the barracks that night before. And we're told that more than 40 angry Jews hatch a plot to kill Paul. Notice their oath. They're not going to eat or drink until he's dead. They better act quickly then, right? <laughs> So they approach the chief priest and the elders. I would imagine the Pharisees probably aren't there 
seeing that they had defended Paul when he was before the Sanhedrin. They tell these group uh, of men their plans. They apparently agree to this, that we're going to reconvene. They might have left the Pharisees out of the loop of what's going on. Uh, and you just kind of told them that they just wanted to examine him some more. But those that were in attendance agreed to reconvene to be able to hear about Paul. And the plan was that as Paul was approaching in the road, you know, on the way from uh, the barracks where he's at to go to where they're convening, that they would ambush him. So much for justice. So much for being obedient to the law. These terrorists would stop at nothing to achieve their selfish religious goals. And this kind of evil plan, as we talked about Ananias last week, surely would have fit right in with his scruples and his lack of morals. But God is going to thwart the plan. And God uses this young man, this nephew, to do so. Any guess exactly who this is and exactly how old he is? Perhaps he's young because here Lysus, the commander, takes him by the hand. But regardless, we don't really know. The only thing that's important here is that he is raised up like Esther for such a time as this. This is the only mention of Paul's family found anywhere in the New New Testament. We actually get the impression uh, from some of his writings that he lost connection with his family after his conversion. But we do know of his sister and a nephew from Luke here. Don't know how he hears of the plan. We're not given those details. So marvel at the sovereignty of God here. Think about just how much control God has over this. He, God often uses the little things, and in this case, even children, to accomplish his great purposes. It illustrates for us this seamless integration between God's sovereignty and human decisions that are made by responsible people. Jesus has already promised Paul, you're going to Rome. But God is going to preserve Paul through the actions of individuals. He's not supernaturally transported from Jerusalem to Rome. No, it's everyday, ordinary situations and circumstances with ordinary and everyday people that God works through. And that ought to be encouraging to us this morning. He's not looking for us to make a name for ourselves, because if we did, then we'd be distracted from his name. No, he uses the, the small, the weak, the insignificant, the forgotten, To be able to carry out his purposes. And that's a good thing because that's what I am. That's what I am. I mean, the nephew here hears of this conspiracy. He relates it to Paul. Paul acts wisely and he tells the centurion to take this boy to the commander. The centurion does his job. Lysa ends up you know, acting to be able to help out Paul, there's no burning bush, is there? There's no sp- sky splitting over, open and a dove coming down, is there? No, there's no earthquake, nothing. There's no light shining on the road to Damascus, is there? But Paul's life is spared nonetheless as a result of people doing what's right there in front of them. And God uses their actions to be able to accomplish his purposes. He does so through the nephew. He does so here next with Lysus. So there in verse 23, this is what we read. He summoned two of his centurions and said, get 200 soldiers ready with 70 cavalry and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at nine tonight. Also provide mounts for Paul to ride and bring him safely to Felix, the governor. He wrote the following letter. Claudius Lysus to the most excellent governor Felix. Greetings. 
When this man had been seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them, I arrived with my troops and rescued him because I learned that he is a Roman citizen. Wanting to know the charge that they were accusing him of, I brought him down before their Sanhedrin. I found out that the accusations were concerning questions of their law and that there was no charge that merited death or imprisonment. When I was informed that there was a plot against this man, I sent him to you right away. I also ordered his accusers to state their case against him in your presence. So Elisha immediately responds to hearing about this threat. He doesn't question the nephew. He doesn't you know, really want you know, go gather other information. He takes the nephew at his word, and he makes immediate plans to transfer Paul to Caesarea. Caesarea is named after Augustus Caesar. It's a beautiful harbor on the Mediterranean Sea, about 25 miles to the northwest city of the city of Samaria. It serves as the Roman military headquarters. And that's where he's going to send Paul. And to be able to protect Paul on the way there, he summons the centurion to prepare 200 infantrymen, 70 mounted soldiers, and then 200 spearmen. For one man. <laughs> he doesn't want anything to happen to Paul, does he? Again, remember, there's 40 Jews that have taken this vow, right? Don't stand a chance against all these Roman soldiers. This action here is a reminder that God even uses secular governments to achieve his purposes. We see it throughout Scripture, don't we? He raises up kingdoms, he tears down kingdoms, all to be able to accomplish his plans. God rules over the affairs of people and nations throughout the scriptures. And why? Because the world is his. It belongs to him. And ultimately, he's about working out his overarching plan, the overarching theme of redemption and restoration. And so he even turns the hearts of rulers and kings Proverbs tells us. So in order to bring the governor Felix up to speed on the situation, Lysus writes this brief letter to him that we have there in verses 25 through 30. And again, we see how the Lord uses Lysus to be able to protect Paul. As notice, Lysus even mentions Paul's innocence. That's key there. There in verse 29, I found that the accusations concerning their law, that there was no charge that merited death or imprisonment. That's huge. That's huge. Lysa is saying he's not guilty of anything. Now Felix is a freed slave, known for being violent. He's known for his loose lifestyle, and he's an ineffective governor. That's not a good mixture, particularly for a Roman official. He rose to this office simply because of his brother. His brother was Paulus, who was for a number of years the head of the imperial civil service. He ends up marrying three different women over the time, and his current wife, Drusilla, is the daughter of Herod Agrippa I. She apparently divorced her, her other husband to be able to marry Felix. And eventually, Felix gets recalled to Rome because he doesn't know how to handle riots in Caesarea. Now, notice this letter here. He starts off by calling him most excellent. Far cry from it. He's trying, Lysa is trying to paint himself as a top-notch soldier. Notice what he says there. This man had been seized by the Jews and was about to be killed. And so I arrived with my troops and rescued him because why? I learned that he is a Roman citizen. Now, if you were here the last couple of weeks, or if you know the book of Acts any at all in this situation, is that exactly how it went down? <laughs> no, Lysus is painting it in a picture that suits Lysus. No, this is far from the truth. Now, he wasn't about to be killed because he was a Roman citizen, and he surely wasn't rescued because he was a Roman citizen. In fact, 
He didn't even know that he was a Roman citizen until he was about to flog him illegally. He thought he was an Egyptian revolutionary. So he conveniently admits that he almost flogged this Roman citizen illegally. But again, what's most important here, though, is this statement on innocence. The problem involving Paul revolves around his theology. It doesn't warrant death. It doesn't warrant imprisonment. Luke here again, as he's telling us this, is reminding the Romans and uh, uh, Theophilus, Christians aren't dangerous to the government in that sense. They're not lawbreakers. They're going to be your most loyal citizens. As long as the government is fair, as long as the government is honest, and they don't make laws that keep you from worshiping God. These events remind us of Paul's experience in Corinth. Remember, he was discouraged there as well. Jesus shows up, reassures him, and he's able to go on. And immediately after this, he's you know, brought you know, before the court. And Galileo stands up and kicks it out of court before Paul can even defend himself, right? Now, yes, there are people during this time period that claim that these Christians are criminals, that they should be imprisoned for injustice. They point to Jesus, who, who was killed as a, quote-unquote, criminal, to be able to support their argument. I mean, he was sentenced by a Roman governor and crucified, but all four Gospels talk about how this Roman governor declared him innocent, found out no guilt in him, washed his hands of the affair. So here's another parallel between what Jesus faced and what Paul was facing. Kind of as a side note application for us here is for us to be honorable citizens. Not to be ruthless pragmatists, breaking laws for the sake of our causes and claiming that we're acting in the name of God. But when the law of the land keeps us from worshiping God or we see that there's injustice, then we speak out. We act out. We live out our faith. But other than that, we ought to be the model citizens. So a nephew, a Roman proconsul, and now an army. Verse 31. So the soldiers took Paul during the night and brought him to Antiparius as they were ordered. The next day they returned to the barracks, allowing the cavalry to go on with him. When these men entered Caesarea and delivered the letter to the governor, they also presented Paul to him. After he read it, he asked what province he was from. When he learned he was from Sicilia, he said, I will give you a hearing whenever your accusers also get here. He ordered that he be kept under guard in Herod's palace. So we're told that the soldiers get gathered, the letter is written, and then the soldiers take Paul to Antiparitus the very, by the uh, cover of night, and they arrive there the next morning. The, the people, the cavalry, the 70 horsemen, ride on with Paul to Caesarea. And while they assume that they are moving a, governor, uh, a prisoner, God is transporting his preacher safely. And even though ruthless Felix is corrupt and incompetent, as we'll get into here in the future, he at least begins the right way. He promises to hear Paul's case as soon as his accusers arrive from Jerusalem, and then he sends the apostle away to be held by Herod's guards. So the nephew thwarts the plan. Lysa reports the plan. The soldiers transport the prisoner. And all of this occurs under the sovereign rule of God. Paul would write that at the right time, at the appointed time, Jesus died for our sins. Everything led up, everything worked out 
to the right appropriate time for God to send his son into the world to take our place upon the cross, to take our sin upon himself, to take God's wrath upon him at the right time. That's the message of the scriptures. From Genesis to Revelation, God has this plan that he's put in place before the foundation of the world. And nothing is going to thwart that plan. Whether it's the overarching redemptive plan that God has in the sending of his son. And think about all the things that had to come into play for Jesus to be born at the right time, at the right place. That's why we see him at work in the Old Testament like we do. And think that that even then is not the completion of the plan. But God's ultimate plan is so that you and I would be redeemed back to him. That our relationship would be restored to him. That our relationship with each other would be restored. That our relationship with creation would be restored. And we see that by the time that we get to Revelation. So everything that has transpired in human history and everything that's going to transpire is all according to to God's plan. Whatever part you have to play in it, whatever part I have to play in it, whatever part Paul or the nephew or Lysus or the soldiers have to play in it, we're here carrying out his work and his purpose. Sometimes God delivers his children by a simple word of a young relative. Sometimes he calls them to Calvary. But at all times, he's ultimately in charge. That's my encouragement for us this morning. Regardless of what you're going through, regardless of what you're experiencing, or have, or will, this is our reminder that God is always in control. Even the darkest, most evil act known to man, crucifying an innocent man, was used for God's purpose and his glory. So that's the thing. While Jesus was crucified, and as horrible as it was, that was the plan that God had to be able to call sinners home, to be able to restore what was broken, knowing that you and I have earned death through our sin. But that free gift of God eternal life through Christ Jesus. Just a reading of scripture reveals that to us. God has an infinite number of options for working out his will in our life. While our daily lives might not look all that spectacular, we can be assured that God is lovingly involved in the affairs of of his people. Again, we might not see his handiwork. We might not see his fingerprints, but he's there. Paul would tell the Philippians, I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. So he's not finished with us yet. Thank God he's not finished with us yet. We are a work in progress. But it is a work that he will bring to completion. And one day, one day when we stand before our Savior face to face, it'll all be worth it, won't it? It'll all be worth it. So trust him in the difficult circumstances. Trust him in everyday life. Trust him even when you don't see him. And thank him for his care and protection. Let's pray.